I'm going to answer a lot of your FAQs, lots of questions that you have for me over and over again. And so we've compiled a whole list that I'm going to be running through. But I've got a question for you because a lot of the things that you have asked me about don't relate necessarily to gardening. They relate to um, gardening related things, but not necessarily to plants and garden design. So if there are related topics that you would like me to cover, whether it's uh, tablescapes or it's, I don't know, entertaining or the holidays or any other kind of related things, let me know. And those are things that we can all pursue and explore together. So that's my question of the day for you guys before I start answering your questions. Well, oh my gosh, is it steamy out here. Definitely spring has arrived after all of that rain we had that just magically transformed into all sorts of heat and humidity and mosquitoes, I think. So I'm gonna talk about some of the frequently asked questions that you guys put in the community tab and that you have asked over time. And I thought I would start here because a lot of them are about topiary. And you, let's see, what do you wanna know? Um, what kinds of plants are appropriate and do I, bring them inside over the winter? Do I leave them outside? Well, let's start out with what plants are appropriate. I think the classic type of plant is probably boxwood, and it is what a lot of mine are. Now, up until this year, I would say, oh, I just leave them outside, and it's not a problem in my zone seven garden. They've been outside for years, and some of them have. Uh, but this past year, as I have said on and on after that, uh, record 13 below uh, record setting cold snap that we had in February, I lost some of my most prized ones. Would I, uh, so I guess then that begs the question, would I get some to replace them and would I keep them outside year round, especially the really large expensive ones and I would do it in a heartbeat. So I think it's a gardening risk worth taking when you're really passionate about something. So the boxwood ones I leave outside and in general, if a plant is winter hardy, about two zones colder than your own, then they can stay in a pot outside. Now, none of the myrtle topiary stay outside. These all go inside in the winter time, and I use them around the holidays. These lemon cypress come in and they come, they go back out. Myrtle topiary really wants strong, full sunlight. In fact, over here, they're almost in too much shade. Don't ever, ever, ever let them dry out because they will die on you before you can, um, before you could shake your head. And, but, but they're absolutely beautiful. You ask where to get them. I get them, uh, most of the ones I have now, I got from Angela at Paso Passiflora Kalamazoo up in Michigan. No, they are not inexpensive, but they are worth it. And some of these I've had for years, you just, but they do need some TLC. Don't ever let them dry out. Um, what small trees are appropriate? Well, if you go back into my archive on lots of videos, you will see, let's start walking this way, Stuart. You'll see lots of plants that I have transformed into topiary. Everything from little blue point junipers that I dug up or little cherry laurels that I dug up from my own landscape. Really any kind of, of evergreen or conifer or small tree that has, that has gone to seed and volunteered in your own garden. I call it free gardening. And you just go dig them up, put them in a pot, what have you got to lose? And some of them have made brilliant topiaries that I've had for years. Some of my cherry laurels in, are in the back. I should have moved them up for you to see. Um, so now we're gonna go into my studio. And because so many of you, one of the big questions you ask is, what does it look like in this little cottage back here? Well, this is a was a detached garage with servants' quarters. And the servants' quarters were very small, and we expanded them. We took out a portion of the garage, we expanded it, and we turned it into what I call, oh, sometimes we call it the office, but now we call it the studio. 
because it's, I, I have done a lot of shooting in here and you can probably tell that now there's kind of an echo once I come inside. So this is now where, Stuart's trying to shut that door so the mosquitoes don't follow us. Um, it has a wood burning fireplace in here. It is filled with some antiques from, um, that belong to my husband's grandfather and some other things, but it's where we shoot the QVC segments. It's where I used to shoot lots of segments before COVID um, with Linda Cavanaugh for Channel 4. And basically now it is where we hold meetings and most recently it's been where I've been writing my book. So if you turn, Stuart, if you don't mind turning around, you can kind of see what my view is out these French doors. It's also where we store all of, all of my uh, husband's fly fishing accoutrement. And then out here, just disregard all of the cables and everything we've got back in here. This is what it looks like out the other set of French doors. So I can work at this desk or I can work at the table and I've always got a view of the garden. And don't judge me on my dirty windows right now. Oh, if you look out there, Stuart right there, that's one of my cherry laurels right there sitting on the stoop. So that's one of the cherry laurels that I'm turning into, into a topiary. So there's the potage from this aspect. You probably very infrequently get to see it from this angle. Okay, so now back to, back to some questions. I'm going to come over here. Be careful, Stuart, backing up. So, okay, so that brings me to Stuart. Those of you who have have followed me and subscribed here on YouTube for a long time. You know that Stuart is my photographer. He is my BFF. He's my business partner, but he is not my husband. So, so some of you, I think it, it seems like there's a disconnect when I talk about my garden or my house or whatever, and I don't include Stuart in that. It's because Stuart is not my husband. How did we start working together? Was it like five or six years ago? We, yeah, we started working together when I started um, kind of being a spokesperson for the Southern Living Plant Collection. And we did a lot of things for them. We hit it off. We have the same kind of wicked sense of humor and we have just become great friends. He now spends lots of holidays with us and we tease each other mercilessly. So believe me, if you ever think I'm being mean to Stuart, I promise you it is reciprocated <laughs> and he teases me just as much. He does not like to be on camera. My husband does not like to be on camera. That's why you seldom see him other than in a reflection though you can hear his voice. At some point in time, they may decide to reveal themselves, but that is, that is up to their discretion. And I don't want to um, impose my willingness to be in front of the camera. Oh, was that? Okay, there you go. There's your reflection du jour. Um, so basically, that's, that's our relationship, and it works out, it works out great for us. Um, back to the topiaries. Do the topiaries get root bound? Some of them do, and then like any plant, you just repot them. So that's, um, you know, that's, that's kind of a no-brainer. Um, Will you flip the camera to see your face? We literally took these and we wrote down what questions you ask. How did Linda find you? It was because, how did I find you? Oh, I had written, I was in a magazine article. Some, I had written a magazine article and there was a photographer and it was actually the, the editor of that magazine who suggested Stuart as a photographer. Uh, perennials, top 10 that reseed each year. I did a video on that not too long ago where I talked, to, uh, it was a walkabout, I believe, where I talked a lot about annuals or biennials that reseeded. I, I, in terms of perennials, I would say you can get some daisies, you can get rudbeckia, you can get coneflower, certainly veronica, those will self-seed and a lot of them, if they're a sedum, you can just start from a cutting. Other than that, the annuals like, um, well, even zinnias, cosmos, uh, nicotiana, um, foxgloves of biennial, larkspur, chamomile, those will go to seed 
whether or not you're successful at that kind of depends on your growing zone and how much rain there is and all sorts of uh, different kind of mitigating factors. Um, <laughs> a lot of you called me on it last time. They wondered if I had been drinking when I was talking about alcohol wipes and I said alcoholic wipes. Well, maybe those wipes were alcoholics. I don't, I don't know. Um, but yes, periodically my, my mouth gets ahead of my brain and I say stupid stuff like that. So I appreciate that you guys called me on that. I thought it was pretty funny. Um, uh, QVC stuff. Okay, so I actually have this staged for you guys. How did I, I hook up with QVC? Um, about a, over a year ago, a year ago last March, they actually contacted me to see if I would put together a product line based on things that they had seen in, in my garden that we, we kind of messed with the design a little bit to improve the design. And we called it the Signature Touches, uh, Linda Botter Signature Touches Garden Collection. And these are all things that I have that I use in my garden but that you necessarily you couldn't necessarily find anywhere and one of them this is not a sales pitch believe me i you know i'm a huge fan of thrifting so if you can find any of these things at a thrift store i say you go for it but a lot of these things you absolutely cannot and the only way i i've been able to access them so many of you have asked is to make them myself with QVC, QVC, who's been wonderful in that regard. So I did not know if these lattice work plant supports would be available this season or not, and lo and behold, they are. They come in the same three finishes in copper, in black, and in this galvanized metal. And these are the kinds of things that I use them for. And in my own garden right now, I'm actually, I just ordered some more of these because I want these galvanized metal ones to be plant supports in my uh, inside the four quadrants of the potager for tomatoes, peppers, things of that nature. These are cardoons. I love the way this galvanized looks with this bucket. So, and these were based on a bunch of plastic plant supports that I found at Ace Hardware. They actually were supports that went to a hanging basket of tomatoes and they had lost their hanging basket and there was just a stack of them. And I bought them and I have been using them and a lot of you think that they're, they are metal and they're not and they're not very sturdy, but voila, we have managed to transform them and improve on them. And these are metallic and they're on the qvc.com right now, you can find them. Um, and, uh, and I absolutely love them. They're great with dahlias, they're great with vegetables, they're great with anything. I've got one inside that I have standing in a corner that I use as an umbrella stand. It's got umbrellas uh, and walking sticks and things of that nature. You could put a tray on top and it would be, uh, it would make a wonderful little side table, but I think they're absolutely beautiful. I can see them around the holidays. If you had a plant or something and putting a hurricane with a candle in them, there's a million trillion things that you can do. So I wanted to point that out because you guys can get these now and they do come in copper and, and black. Um, those were the finishes that we kind of decided on. And here is the evolution of that. I love things that are galvanized. And I love things that match, not too matchy-matchy, but that coordinate with one another in the garden. So I, I, when we developed the product, this is kind of my thinking, I wanted them to kind of be in suites. So there is, this is the galvanized suite. Now this bucket is my own and this is my own, but everything else are part of the QVC line because you could put these at different places in the garden and then they all kind of match one another and they're consonant with one another. And I can imagine about a million ways to do things. I think the hardest part, and I don't, I don't say this as a sales pitch, really the hardest part would be deciding which one you want because for me, that's kind of a seasonal consideration. I absolutely love this galvanized one for the summertime. I would take this bucket, I would set it in here. I'd fill it with ice and put cold drinks and beer and things like that in here. Um, I would use it as a plant stand. I love the way it looks with anything that's got a Mediterranean vibe to it. So a huge rosemary would look incredible in here. But honestly, if it were in the fall, I would want black, 
because the black one I would put orange pumpkins in and gourds and I think that would just look so spectacular. And in that case then, I would probably order everything else in black because I like the idea of it being in a suite. And let me, Stuart can kind of show you close-ups on those. Here's another thing, uh, this egg obelisk. Um, this is also part of the suite. I didn't have it here. And I have used these in so many different ways, you guys. I have used these during the holidays where I have filled them with small pumpkins and gourds. I filled them with pine cones. I've put them on top of beautiful hanging baskets of ivy. And then I've put a candle in here, nestled a candle in here. So there's different things you can do. Right now, I don't know if you noticed, but going up and down my back steps, I have three small pots of boxwood. These all have one of these frames over them and then I just trim them and once the boxwood grow out, it's um, baby gem boxwood. Once that grows out, it will perfectly match the form of this obelisk. So it's kind of a cheat for taupe beards. So that's kind of my, my little, my thinking on QVC, how it evolved. Um, there will be more products coming and there will probably be another line next year. I'm not sure. What is, somebody wanted to know, what's the best seller? Um, I don't have sales figures on a lot of things yet, but I do know that if you like the copper stuff, that definitely the copper in this sold out real fast. And my sister was kind of, I guess, symbolic of that because she bought two of them and they were both in copper. So it kind of depends on what your personal aesthetic is. I think it would look really, this also has kind of a farmhouse chic look, but I think if I had a loft apartment, I might want black or copper because uh, these would look fabulous inside with a huge cactus or succulent spilling out of it. Um, just any really huge plant, it would look remarkable. The other thing that I'm going to do, my head is just going crazy, you can tell. I, I'm going to, at Christmas time, I'm gonna put a live Christmas tree in here. And one thing that I did, and part of an inspiration for this, is that I, I am nuts about spray paint. So, Anything that's then galvanized, I have in this fashion that I spend money on, and then I'll just go out and I'll pick up things from my garden and I will spray paint them. So in this, one year I did a whole Thanksgiving that was, I called it the galvanized blue and white Thanksgiving. The table was set in blue and white china, everything was blue and white china, and then I had galvanized pumpkins and spray um, foliage and acorns and all sorts of things that were all spray painted with galvanized uh, spray paint, and they looked incredible. So I can already see doing something similar with this, putting my Christmas tree in it, and then having all sorts of wonderful, oh, here, here, this is a perfect example. Stay right there, Stuart. I spray painted one Christmas a bunch of these huge sugar pine cones and I spray painted them galvanized metal and I mean wouldn't this be so cool put your Christmas tree in there and then you have all of these pine cones around the base as a mulch for your Christmas tree or if you didn't want to do a Christmas tree then you just get these huge pine cones you could spray them or not fill this up with these mammoth pine cones or pumpkins or whatever, put some greenery in there. And I just think it would be absolutely spectacular. And that's kind of how my brain works. The original inspiration from this was from something that I saw in a Swedish, uh, uh, outside of a Swedish country home. They actually used it as a little fire pit. Now we can't sell these on QVC as a fire pit because embers might, you know, go out and things, um, but definitely you could put firewood in it or, or whatever. And some of you have seen my old one, the inspiration model from a long time ago that I got um, off of eBay, it was an antique and I use it for that purpose. Okay, so en enough of that. So back to my list. Um, in a pot, uh, Japanese maple, can I put it in a pot? Yes, Japanese maples do great in pots. Just make sure the pot is large enough and that the pot itself is winter uh, resistant and can, can 
handle whatever kind of winter you have. And then if it doesn't look happy in that pot, you can put it into the ground. They like soil pretty much on the acidic side. Okay, so many, so many questions. I get so many questions about my turf. Is it an artificial turf? Yes, it is. It's a, a very highly realistic, high quality synthetic turf that I've had in the front yard for about eight years. I've had it back here for about seven years. It's some of the best money I ever spent. Um, my first, I think my first priority in looking for it was I wanted it to be realistic. And the second was I wanted it to be uh, low maintenance and I didn't want any kind of synthetic infill or anything like that. And so I bet I researched it for I don't know how many years. I probably looked at a hundred different samples. So, so here I'm burying the lead. The company is called NextGen and I will put a link below. I am also getting ready, Stuart remind, wanted to remind me, we did a, re, a huge deep dive into my artificial turf, talking with David, my friend that I have become good friends with over the years who installed it originally. And he and I did a long discussion. We answered all sorts of questions related to it. Um, regarding cost, regarding all of those kinds of things, environmental issues, all of that. And we're going to put that up. When are we putting that? Uh, tomorrow. Tuesday. Tuesday. On Tuesday, we're going to put that up and it will answer every single question you have uh, about my synthetic turf. Cost per square footage. Is it for everyone? No. Believe me, if I had a large garden, I would, or a large lawn space, I would not have this. Um, I got it. My considerations were where I live, fungal problems. I have, I have had both my front and my back lawn completely destroyed in a day from a garden tour or a photo shoot. It gets so much traffic. It couldn't hold up to the traffic or the heat and the humidity. And because it's basically a little throw rug of a lawn, it's not a wall-to-wall car -wall carpet. For me, it was the perfect solution, especially when I found out that they could make it look exactly the way it did when I had real turf. So the edging, all of that, I could show you two pictures side by side, what was the real turf, what was the artificial turf, and I would defy you to be almost be able to tell the difference because it looks identical in terms of its edging, the stone placement, everything like that. Um, what are my, oh, how, how well is it held up? Brilliantly. How does it drain? Perfectly. Uh, does it get hot? Yes, it will get hot in the summertime. Um, that's all related to the turf. What are my favorite boots, tools, and gloves? I've answered that pretty much ad nauseum, but uh, most of them are always linked below. So if you go to the description, and if you're not sure how to get to the description, if you're watching this on your phone, there is a little, is it an arrow, Stuart, or... Um, Right below the video on the right hand side, there's a little icon and you click on it and it will put the written description of what I just talked about with all relevant links. And, and there are some that are there permanently. So you can always find what my favorite pruners are, what my uh, go to uh, Captain Jack's bug dust is, all of those kinds of things. Those are permanent links below my videos that you can go to any time. So a lot of you who ask those questions over and over again, it's just as easier on me if I just put the links below. So figure out how to access the description because you'll get all sorts of information there. And so I have a boot fetish. I have a million different kinds of boots. My, my boots are, my favorite boots are probably hunter boots. I love merry people boots. Um, I, I guess I love the one I'm with. There's, I love Jules boots. I have some from Target. I have a whole wardrobe of boots. They're very much one of my own personal signature touches. So I like all of those. I love tools, um, from, uh, Bridgetown. I love Barnell pruners. I love Fiskers. I love all sorts of, of garden tools. A lot of those you'll find below. Um, what online mail order companies do you like best? I love Gardener Supply. 
Um, I love Southern Living Plant Collection, absolutely love them, and Encore Azalea. Their plants are just spectacular. Um, who else do I like? I love to get ideas from terrain. Um, who else do I go to online? Um, I got some of my bat, my uh, faux wicker furniture that I've got in my backyard. I got that from World Market. So I, I shop a lot of different places. Um, what are my favorite magazines? Uh, obviously, Southern Living. I love Garden Gate magazine. I love Garden Design. Um, I am pretty good friends with the editor at Garden Design and very good friends with the editor at Garden Gate magazine. And I've had a relationship with Southern Living for I don't know how many years. Um, there's lots of local magazines. Um, so I'm like you, I love Martha Stewart, obviously. So that's all of that. Um, I, I don't know how many times I got asked this question. So if, you're, if, if you don't wanna hear it, then you can just kind of tune out. What color is my lipstick? Um, well, I wear different colors, but here's, here's my go-to. I like, and I will try to remember to put a, a link below, Wet n Wild Gel Lip Liner Lay Down the Mauves. It's just a, it's just a drugstore lip liner. Um, it's Wet n Wild. I really like it. Um, and I like Wet n Wild lipstick. These are cheap. They're like buying samples. I find them to be every bit as good as the more expensive stuff. And this is 526C. That's the pink color I wear a lot. And then I wear other, other things. I am somebody, uh, okay, so this will be the next question about thrifting. Um, where, how did I start thrifting or What's my attitude about thrifting? I've talked to, about that a little bit in my videos. Um, I am one of 10 children. And so I am used to wearing hand-me-downs. I have uh, six sisters and, or five sisters and four brothers. And I'm used, I'm just used to that. And I'm also, I have, which also means that I have tons of nieces and nephews and really young stylish gals in my family. And I've always been thrifty, but I think I really started looking at them as a brilliant source of really stylish, inexpensive stuff from those girls. We would go to thrift stores in their college towns and oh my gosh, the stuff that they would come up with was just absolutely brilliant. I also, for years, worked at Oklahoma City University as director of admissions there, and they've got a huge school of theater and, and performance. And a lot of the, the um, theatrical people, when they were staging and getting costuming and stuff, a lot of times they would go to Goodwill and they'd go to thrift stores, um, just like people who are looking for Halloween costumes. They would get remarkable things there. And so I think that in addition to my just being generally thrifty by being one of, of 10 kids, I also just found that there was tremendous style to be had there for pennies. And in addition to the ecological benefits of it, that not, you know, the lower carbon footprint, I just say, why not? And I'm the type of person that might spend $3 on a jacket at Goodwill and then spend $40 to have it tailored to fit exactly the way I want. So I'm kind of, I, I like that tension between high and low. I, I just, I will spend money on something for good quality, but I am not at all embarrassed to say that I got something at Goodwill or at a thrift store. In fact, sometimes my husband will say, because I'm so proud of it, if I have a great thrift store bargain, he'll say, you don't have to tell everybody. <laughs> <laughs> that you shop at secondhand stores. And I say it because I'm proud of it. And he, and, you know, he, he probably thinks it's a reflection on him. So for me, if I have a great score, whether it's clothing, whether it's any of these kinds of things, then I am thrilled with it. And if you can find the same thing for less at a thrift store, I say go for it. Now, a lot of you say you must have a really good Goodwill, you must have really good thrift stores. I guess I do. 
Um, I, I, I don't know. And I, and I know that in some places, maybe, I don't know how they're run or whatever. I can't speak to the ethics of it. All I can speak to is I know the mission of my local Goodwill store and the thrift stores that I patronize. And so I am, I am good with them. And I think, it, I think it's fun. I think it's creative. I think it's a wonderful, and it's a wonderful way for young people in, in college and things who are developing a certain look to develop their own style without spending a ton of money. And it also helps them learn fiscal responsibility. And oh, I can buy this for $150 on Amazon, or I can buy this for $4.99, and it's got a chic kind of wear and tear look. I mean, we are the generation, and they are too, that buys jeans that have holes in them, and we spend extra for the holes. So, as part of my philosophy that I really like things that are pre-loved and pre-used, um, I guess that's my, that's my, I'm sorry, I went on and on about that. That's my thrifting mentality. Plant diseases and pests, mosquito control. I am like you, if there is a really, really wonderful way to get rid of mosquitoes, please let me know. Stuart would really like to know because unfortunately they plague him terribly, me not so much. They don't like whatever furomes I put out or my blood type or whatever. I did have it sprayed recently with um, a company that uses botanicals that are all organic, that don't hurt pollinators or anything. And I would say it maybe diminished them by maybe 50%, maybe. It's hard to tell because we've just started to get into the really hot season. Um, I also use some of the different devices, Thermacell, um, that you can get off of Amazon. We use bug spray. I try to remember to empty out all saucers that have water, all of those common sense things. But basically, if you have a lush garden, you have mosquitoes. If you have a lush garden, you have bugs. And that's just, that's just kind of the, the way it is. Uh, how do I handle pests? As a rule, I would say that I use lots of Captain Jack's bug dust. Um, I use lots of neem oil. I use insecticidal soap, and I make that concoction with baking soda, um, horticultural oil, water. I, I use that and make the homemade brew. You can Google that and find it anywhere. Um, I very, very infrequently go to anything that is, that is just really dangerous or toxic stuff. If it push came to shove and I was going to lose some really, really prized specimen and the only way I knew to do that was to use some kind of potent fungicide or insecticide, might I do it? I might, um, but most of, my, most of the things in my garden can be handled this way. When it gets so bad that they're about to completely decimate something, then usually that's towards the end of the season and I'm willing to put up with it at that point because the season's about to end anyway. But I am a big fan of dormant oil spray of anything that you can do to mitigate those kinds of pest problems. Um, as always, I didn't ask my question at the beginning of the video, so I'm gonna ask it now. Uh, and you may ask why I ask so many questions. It's because I'm a questioner. If you take Gretchen Rubin's um, Four Tendencies quiz and you can see what kind of person you are, I'm a questioner and I find, I just like to know stuff. I like to know about where you live. I like to know about what your climate is. I like to get solutions to personal problems I have. So thank you anyone who recommended plumber's tape for my leaking valves. Thank you to the person who suggested maybe that I relocate the boxwood balls that are overgrown in the potager. Thank you for the person who told me about tool as a deterrent to keep squirrels out. Trust me, I read your comments and some of them even have come up in, um, in the text that I'm writing in my book because you guys have great, have great answers. More importantly, you have an answer to someone else's issue that they are experiencing in your same zone. So that's why I always say, please, please, please put your zone there so that people know where your garden, because my zone B problems might not be the same as somebody who's in 5A. So make sure that you put that there. And you guys have become a tremendous resource for one another because people now are reading, not just me, other people are now reading your comments and commenting on them because 
they are so helpful. So despite the cynics who say that I just do it for the algorithm, no, I do it to get information. I do it to get to know you guys better and for all of us to kind of build a helpful gardening community. Stuart is, Stuart is laughing. So, um, so I think there's that pretty much, there's probably more questions. Those are, those are some of the most frequently asked ones. Um, obviously, if you've got more questions, I'm sure that you will post them below. So I have a question for you. If there was another kind of category that was related to gardening, but not gardening exactly, that you would like to dive into a little bit more, then please let me know. Um, whether it's tablescapes, whether it's uh, the holidays, things like that, please let me know. Some of you I know are kind of interested in fashion, but not everyone. And oh, one last question that I'm gonna leave on. Why haven't we been doing garden tours like we did last season? COVID for one, um, we will start doing again, doing them again too, uh, but partly it's also because so many gardens in my area were devastated this past winter. I've talked about that a lot and people don't want to show their gardens when they're in the process of recovery and I respect that and also because of, of COVID and because the weather has just been really rainy recently and that is my signal I think. Somebody's trying to call me so that's my signal to close this. Thank you guys. Hopefully you enjoyed that FAQ session. Well, here is my fashion epilogue for today. My top is from Target many, many years ago. My britches, you guys got a kick out of my calling them britches. My pants, I absolutely love these. These are lightweight. I think of them as kind of, I dream of genie pants. These are made well. I got them at uh, Nordstrom Rack. I love them. I especially love them because they have pockets. So they're not as hot as jeans and they're easy to work in the garden. Uh, these are my favorite brand, I'm not even sure what the brand is, but I'll put a link below, of foot form sandals. They come in every different color. I get them off of Amazon. I have several pair. They're great for the garden. I can get them wet and water can get on them and they're, and they're, and they're kind of cute. Um, my uh, necklace, I can't remember where it came from. Uh, I can't remember where it came from. Oh, Stella and Dot. It was from a Stella and Dot party that a friend of mine had. My earrings, oh, I am gonna do, I won't go into it now, but oh my gosh, look at these. These, that, the, the, can you see the color there, Stuart? Okay, that is based on some tile work from a 15th century convent. These were done by uh, a jewelry designer. I'm gonna tell you all about her and how you can get hold of her. She's on Etsy, I'll put a link below. But this is just a little tease because I'm gonna show you some of her other work. It's absolutely fascinating to me. And every piece has a story and I love things that have, that have a story. Okay, this is kind of a little extra thing that I just thought you guys would be interested in. Um, I don't do a lot of shopping, but recently I found my favorite summer pajamas on Amazon and I have this is my third pair that I bought and they are <laughs> they're just cute little shorty pajamas but I love them because they've got this kind of tuxedo vibe and they've got a black rim and I just like them they're so so oh sorry sorry Stuart they're so so comfortable I was they're so so comfortable I love them they were just like $25 or something. I'll put a link below. I have them in baby blue and I have them in this color and I love them because they're really, really comfortable when I'm trying to, you know, get out of just the t-shirt and it's a seasonal change. It's post COVID. So I'm, I'm kind of stepping up my summer uh, wardrobe, even at night. And then this was just given to me. I love this. My sister had one and I loved it. And then my BFF Deborah found this. She said it looked just like me and it is, and this is probably, it's probably some, well, no, maybe it's not. Anyhow, this is a table runner, you guys. 
Isn't that incredible? I love the texture of it. I love absolutely everything about it. I can think of a million ways to use it. And my sister had one and I just, I just loved it. And she got this off of Amazon, you guys, off of Amazon. I absolutely love it. I would probably, I'll probably get another one because one wouldn't work on my dining room table. I want it to hang over the side, so I might get another one. But I'll put a link below to this because this looks like us, you guys out there and me, I think. I absolutely love it. So I'll put a link to that below and I can't wait to use it this fall. Um, I'm already thinking of a million different ways to style it. So there you go. There's your uh, fashion epilogue with a little bonus.